and welcome to another edition of a crossover episode here on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm Chris Carter. He's Jeff Lloyd. It's Steelers meeting up with the Browns. We do this every year, AFC North Showdown. It's going to be a really fun episode. And thank we thank you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making us the Locked On Podcast Network, that is. And we are free and available on all platforms to listen to your podcast. This episode is also brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Jeff, I'm loving it because we're back on the air together, my friend. How have you been? (laughs) Uh, Chris, I've been good. Um, Who are we kidding? We we know both. We uh, we circled these ones. Uh, You know, Obviously, the Browns-Steelers games. Um, And now it's maybe where – I mean, look, it's always been a rivalry, but it's really hard to call it a rivalry when one team is never winning any of these yeah, games. Yeah. Um, but I think you know we've maybe achieved the fact that it's a little bit more of a rivalry now. Um, it's almost I know Browns fans like they're like almost kind of like pinching themselves like there's like an opportunity here where the Browns will have possibly beaten the Steelers in the last three games they played. Knock on wood, we're not going that far just yet, kids. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to see that maybe little brother after all these years is maybe finally uh you know kind of closed the gap, so to speak. A, a friend of mine, Tom Reed, a long time a feature features writer with me over at DKPittsburghSports.com. He lives in Columbus. But one thing he's always told me, he's that like, hey, it's not a rivalry until you have a win against your the opponent that hurts them. And there was no doubt that the that Steelers fans felt the pain when the Browns went into Heinz Field and beat the Steelers in the playoffs last year. So there's definitely a rivalry element to this game. And Steelers fans have been have had this on circled on their calendar for a long time. Browns fans, Browns fans have been doing the same thing. They've been made from t-shirts with the nameless great faces quotes that we've seen at the training camp pictures it's been a live situation so far but let's get to some actual browns questions for this game now uh jeff we looked at this at, at this last game and thursday night football the browns were up against it no nick chubb no kareem hunt offensive line missing baker mayfield hurt it was like man who do they even have for this game and somehow they found a way to win this guy named dearness johnson comes in runs the football for over 140 yards, dominates the ground. And it and Mike Tomlin even talked about this in his presser on Tuesday. He talked about how with Case Keenum, it, it didn't look any different. He's like, this looks like the Browns executing how they always execute. Is it? Is, is this all about really the coaching and the schematics of how this and how they just continue to find ways to succeed um, uh, with – uh, with with, uh, with Kevin Stefanski's game plan, or was Case Keenum really that and above and beyond as a as a game manager to keep the keep the game head in the right direction? I think what it is, yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to coaching. And you know, Dearness Johnson, you know, he he's been here for all of 2019. He was here for all of 2020. And the problem was, is you know, you're caught behind Kareem Hunt, you're caught behind Nick Chubb. When are you really going to get your opportunity? Uh, right. Had a really really big game last year. Uh, you know, that was the week Nick Chubb got hurt down in Dallas. Had you know 14 carries, I think it was 97 yards or whatever. Here was the opportunity. It was his first start. And you know, I had Dearness on the show the other day and talking about Thursday night. And like he had his family in town and they all came and he's like, Look, I still don't know if I'm gonna start. Like, you know, there's a chance it might be Nick. And then they finally were like, No, look, we're just gonna run with Dearness this week. But it shows that, you know, even though you are maybe the 50th, 51st, 52nd, 53rd guy on the roster. Everybody is bought in. Everybody's paying attention. Everybody knows what's going on. So, you know, God forbid that number does get called. And you saw it with Ernest Johnson. And I think the most impressive thing with Ernest Johnson was is you saw a player who plays behind Nick Chubb, plays behind Kareem Hunt. And what you saw was, you know, some things from both of those players. The patience to let your blocks get to where they needed to be so the holes were created. The patience to sell it a little bit to the right because you knew you wanted to cut back to the left. And then some Kareem Hunt where it was, all right, three guys, we're about to crash at the 25-yard line. I'm not going out at the 25. I'm at mm-hmm. least getting at the 23, maybe the 22. I'm not making it easy on you guys. I'm not just going Ball down. All forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a really, really impressive. And, and for a guy, I mean, everybody knows the stories. And for a guy who probably you know never should have been in that opportunity, you know, it takes a lot of luck to get there. Um, and But look, Dearness Johnson is going to have an opportunity here for the next couple of weeks, even with Nick, Nick Chubb looking like he will be back on Sunday. Browns right. like to play like to play a lot of running backs, and you don't look at a guy who just went twenty two for one forty four and say, "Oh well, thanks." You know, we'll call you again when we need you. Um, they like to run two running backs. Dearness Johnson going to get a little opportunity here, I'm sure, on Sunday. 
He, cert he certainly should. I mean, the way that he played, he earned more reps there. Even if Nick Chubb's back, you got to give him a breather. And it's that one-two punch at the running back position that has always been special with the Browns since they've uh, since they've gotten things going again. Another thing you got to look at this offense, there are nine players with at least 100 receiving yards on, on the dock. you got Anthony, Anthony Schwartz, Demetric Felton, Jarvis Landry, Rashard Higgins, Austin Hooper, Kareem Hunt, Odo Beckham Jr., Donald People Jones, and David Njoku. The, the, there's no definite, like, one guy that the Browns always go to. It's a spread it around system. And again, I think that's credit to Kevin Stefanski. There's not one person on this offense that you say, hey, you know, this is the guy. You only go to this guy. You know, it's not like Antonio Brown when the Steelers could just go to him on any single, any given play and he was just going to beat you. But this kind of makes it harder to game plan for. Is there a guy that there's that there's a rhythm for in the offense? I've really liked what I've seen out of Donovan People Jones. He's becoming a big playmaker, kind of proving a lot of the scouts wrong again, that had him pegged as just a eh, you know you know fast for no reason kind of receiver in college. Uh, but you know, again with Jarvis Landry and Odo Beckham Jr. and you team, think those are your big playmakers, but you're spreading the ball like this. Who's is there a security blanket guy on this team, or is it just everybody kind of plays that role? I think the thing that we've seen established here, and look, they can have all of these guys that they want and even have big name players like Odell Beckham Jr., Jarvis Landry. But you go back to, and again, this is maybe contingent on Baker Mayfield. We'll see whether or not he's a quarterback on Sunday. It didn't matter. In 2018, he was a rookie. He was excelling with Brashard Perriman, mm -hmm. Darren Fells. I mean, these guys are lighting up the NFL. But it was always, I don't care who it is. If you're open, that's who I'm throwing it to. And look, I think we've gotten to the point now in the NFL where the skill is so great that even if you are the fourth or fifth wide receiver, if you're the open guy, you're usually going to produce. If you can't catch, you're not in the NFL. You are not a right. fourth. You're not a fifth wide receiver. That's how deep the skill position is. Um, I think they've done a great job of rotating in and out. Um, and it was tough for Donovan Peoples-Jones because it was a monster week against the Cardinals, um, probably his biggest game as a pro. And then all of a sudden, here we were, you know, what, 30 seconds before kickoff on Thursday Night Football? Uh, Donovan Peoples -Jones, Jones has a groin, and then they showed him, and he's throwing the gloves down. So you knew he wasn't going to be a part of it. Um, so he's a little bit dinged up. We know Odell's dinged up. Jarvis Landry is probably a little bit dinged up. We'll hear more, you know, as the week progresses to where these guys are. But then you have Richard Wiggins, Richard Higgins. You have Anthony Schwartz. You have three tight ends that they love to use. Um, you, know, they are probably missing something in the receiving game without Kareem Hunt. He brings a lot to that. And, but then there's Demetric Felton, where you can put him on the field and say, oh, well, you're going to key on the back out of the backfield. All right, we'll just we'll, we'll have a motion out, and he'll just go play a slot. What are you going to do about this? There's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of maneuverability with their skill position. And I think for Coach Stefanski, I think he's just having a lot of fun with it because it's kind of like, well, all right, well, let's try this. Well, we can do this. Or, we, you know, tight end screens. You know, all right, well, now we're going to screen, run a screen the other way to the running back. Oh, let's go with a wide receiver screen to our sixth wide receiver just to keep everybody on their to toes. But that's what you do. You don't want to be an offense that ever has anything that's going to be keyed on. Late in the game, four minutes to go. Yeah, you can key on my running back as we try to right. close out the game. But you want to know what? I, I don't want you to have any idea of what I'm doing. And that's where this evolution of the NFL is going right now, which makes you know every game that everybody watches or sits down for on a Sunday so exciting. It's just so diverse. And it's starting to trend more and more like basketball on grass. But look, if you got the athletes, you got the talent, by all means, go ahead and play it that way. Absolutely. Now, I want to get a defensive question in here um, before before we roll to our first break. And this is more of a generic one. When I look at the Browns, you know, numbers wise, the, the number two rushing defense in the NFL, number seven passing defense in the NFL. So, like, they're stopping the yards. But then you look at the points and they're like way down, like past the middle of the pack. I'm like, what's going on with this defense? And, and you saw like the Chargers game. I was like, okay, they're, they're probably going to limit those guys more. And all of a sudden they've given up a lot of points there. I'm like, what is, what is the answer for this? Or what is the tone of this Browns defense right now? Cause you got miles Garrett. Uh, you went and got Johnson at safety. Denzel Ward's out there. Awusu Kormo, granted he's been hurt, but like when he's been in there, things have been looking good. What what is the tone of this defense right now, and and what do you think is the reason for it? Like the low amount of yards, but the high amount of points. Well, the, it comes down to some simple things. They are beating the living daylights out of the bullies, but then when they get confronted with offenses that can get things done, they can't. They don't give even just a, an average effort. I mean, obviously they beat the daylights out of the Bears um, mm -hmm. with Justin Fields. It was a terrible, terrible performance on their part. Oof. But the Vikings, decent offense. But the Browns basically had them in check after the first drive. Mm -hmm. 53 minutes, mm -hmm. the Minnesota Vikings could not do anything. 
when they needed a key stopper two against the Chargers, they could not get it done. Denver, now another team that really doesn't look like they can get out of their own way. So here you are again, basically picking on your little brother, pushing him around. Look, this defense is better. It's better than it is on the weeks when they're playing the really good teams. And it's maybe not as good as it is on the week where they're beating around on the weaklings. I mean, they're not the 85 Bears. There's been weeks where they look at the 85 Bears. They're not. They need to be consistent. And the biggest thing is here, you look at you know what they got at the defensive line. Malik McDowell, former second-round pick. Two former number one overall number one picks in Clowney and Garrett. Malik Jackson, obviously a long-standing, solid veteran in this league. The, the linebacker room, Walker. Um, you have a former Super Bowl MVP in there with Smith. You go to the secondary, littered with former first-round picks, second-round picks, and a $12 million safety in John Johnson the third. Communication, learning to play together, and maybe you take from Thursday night one of your highest of your highs, 10 days, but there's there's been a lot of lapses in communication, like Mike Williams being wide open for 71 yards on a post pattern. That's inexcusable. Mike mm-hmm. Williams is the guy you're taking away. You know, right. if it's Keenan Allen, you know, busting tackles on a great route and picking up 14, you live with that. Mike Williams is the home run hitter. How did nobody pick him up? And you got a lot of this, Chris. The, oh, I thought you and mm. no, 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 no. You better you better take the deep guy. We'll take it. We'll give up the underneath stuff. We'll live to fight another day. They need to grow into a unit. It, it's it's great that there's so much individual talent, but that needs to be over. And it now needs to be referred to as the Cleveland Browns defense, not Miles Garrett, not Jadavian Clowney, not John Johnson the third. The Browns have a really solid defense that put forth a solid effort week in, week out. That's how they need to be referred to. Absolutely. We'll get to some questions from Jeff to me on the Steelers side. But first, we got to tell you guys about McDonald's. This episode of the, uh, of the Lockdown Podcast Network is brought to you by McDonald's, probably serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect. Whether it's a place where classmates are meeting up for a study group, or knowing that they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and an endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries, or win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors in the home team or the away team can come to recharge. It's also the place you look forward to stopping at on a long road trip to rest your legs on a refuel. I can tell you, I can tell you, Jeff, I was just on a long road trip to New York the other week, and on That's my right. way out, I got me some Mickey D's breakfast. On my way back, I got me some Mickey D's breakfast. That's how you do it here. So check out McDonald's, a great sponsor of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. I'm loving it. We're also brought to you by rockauto.com. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why why choose to spend 30%, 50%, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? For example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump is $353 from a chain store, but only $216 from Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family-owned business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you could need from brake parks to tail lamps to motor oil and even new carpet. Go explore their easy to use website today to find the solution to your auto part needs go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck be sure to write locked on in there how did you hear about us box so that they know that we sent you amazing selection reliable little prices all the parts your car will ever need visit rockauto.com today and tell them that locked on sent you and jeff we're going to pass it over to you so you can keep things rolling here on this crossover episode on the locked on podcast network between the steelers and the brands uh, as of course, we appreciate everybody for making Lockdown Steelers, Lockdown Browns your first listen day in, day out. We do yes, all sir. we can for you guys. Chris, first thing, um, Steelers are three and three, but mm-hmm. you go out week one, you knock around the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> and like, and for me, and Chris, I've said this to you for how many years now? No, it's mm-hmm. over, Chris. It's over. You're done. It's over. It's over. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there after week one going, and then the Browns go into Kansas City. Oh, it looks really, really great. And I, at the end of the day, I'm like, Steelers are one and zero, and the Browns are zero and one. How? How? But then, it's not going so well. And look, I mean, I don't. I know you're not happy in fourth place. I'm not really happy in third place. We always both have higher aspirations. But the Steelers are here three and three. What's gotten this team to it here? Is it offense? Is it defense? Is it inconsistency? Is it a little bit of both? What's exactly going on? Because it's weird to even refer to the Pittsburgh Steelers and use the term fourth place. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, they haven't it's since the since the inception of the AFC North, they have never finished in last place in the division. They're the only team in the AFC North to not finish in last place. Um, and so I don't even want to ask who's finished there the most times. But go ahead. <laughs> we, we, we don't need to go into that. But we, but <laughs> to, to talk about it, it's what Mike Tomlin always discussed. There's 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 been very little complimentary football in those losses. You look to the Raiders, the Bengals, and the Packers. Now, granted, you look at those teams' records. It's five and two, five and two. By the way, they're five or two or six and one. Those are three of the best teams in the in the NFL record wise right now. So you look at that and say, okay, maybe they just lost to teams that were better those days. Uh, but when you look at what's going on, the offense has had very little continuity. Ben Roethlisberger has had open receivers. There's times he's hitting the deep ball. He's hit Deontay Johnson for multiple deep balls for touchdowns th this year. But then there's times when there's been guys open in the intermediate areas and he hasn't even looked their way. It's been tough to find a consistency there. Meanwhile, the offensive line has been comp getting completely revamped. We've gone from getting used to seeing Marquise Pouncey, Alejandro Villanueva, David DeCastro, Marcus Gilbert, Roan Foster every year for the past five years to a completely brand new offensive line. And it's taken them time to gel. They're coming together. But again, two rookies, Kendrick Green at center, Dan Moore Jr. at left tackle. Just still learning how to play a second year guard who only started four years, four games last year. Uh, and Kevin Dotson, a free agent, and Trey Turner, and a fourth year guy in Chakuma Corfu who's still figuring out his role at right tackle, though they're also supposed to get back Zach Banner this week. And he's been a guy they've been excited to get back for quite some time off of injured reserve. So you have that along with Najee Harris, who truly is the, the star of the offense. They love giving him the football when he gets the ball in his hands. He's a dangerous man. Um, also, a heck of an interview whenever we get him at the Steelers practice facility. Uh, but but that's the thing on offense. They, they're still finding out who they are. Are they are they a short passing team like last year? Are they going to become a strong running team like they hoped to become this year? They started off as still one of the worst rushing teams through three weeks, but the last three weeks you've seen that pick up. But the pro and I think the problem is is that in a couple games where they started to find themselves a little bit, the defense was having a trouble finding itself. You had several games missing T.J. Watt, Devin Bush, Joe Hayden, Alex Highsmith. You had a game where it was really Melvin Ingram and practice squad guys being the edge rushers, which is not what they've wanted to do. They wanted to have this team be a a dominant defensive front that caused trouble for everyone. They still haven't gotten Stephon Tuitt back, who was their interior defensive lineman with 11 sacks last year. Um, his brother died in the off season, and that kind of got in the way of his rehab process we're still waiting to see if you know when he'll come back mike Thomas did say it's looking better but it's not imminent that he's going to return um so it's really finding that continuity on both sides of the ball they haven't been able to really rely on too many guys to be in there for too many consecutive games because of the injuries um and that's kind of prevented minka fitzpatrick from being the x-factor guy in the middle of the field he's more so been backing up Every guy like Arthur Mullet in the slot, a new guy that they added this year because Mike Hilton went to the Bengals. Uh, he's been backing up James Pierre, a new guy in outside corner because Stephen Nelson went to the Eagles. Uh, so there's been a lot of different – everyone's kind of helping each other out. The question is, will they be able to settle into specific roles and play their actual defense and let their X-Factor guys be X-Factors? And, of course, that being T.J. Watt, Mika Fitzpatrick, Cam Hayward, who him and T.J. Watt still having phenomenal years, even though the Steelers' defense are figuring things out. But it's finding out who they are and letting them play at their best level. They haven't really had a chance to do that yet. But coming off a of bye week, all the guys in their active roster right now are, are healthy. And Mike Tomlin talked about that being a really good thing to get ready for this week. This is going to be a big week to see, okay, what direction are the Steelers heading in? They're on a two-game win streak. They built some wins after some struggles early on. Are they a team that can rebound this year, or is this going to be another year where they – or is this going to be another few weeks where they have to continue to figure out what their identity is? And, uh, you know, the thing with Tua is tough because, I mean, that's something, you know, as much as you need a guy, there's no way you can say, hey, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, his own path as far as, you know, when he is right to actually do this. Mm -hmm. Najee Harris. Um, and obviously it's not been there as far as running the ball. Um, and it almost seems, you know, crazy to think that, you know, you spent a first round pick on a running back who actually saw 19 targets in one game. Um, but it, look, it's not that he's not doing everything he can. And, you know, this was part of the thing. And I know we talked about Chris was maybe it was a little early to make a selection like that because you don't normally revamp an entire offensive line and then say, oh, well, we'll invest in a first round running back too at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, that's the thing, though. The Steelers kind of knew, and this was why I was okay with the pick in the offseason, was because they had their eyes on certain offensive linemen. All those guys flew off the board really fast. And they're like, well, we can't get one of those guys, so let's get Najee Harris to kind of, to kind of balance things out. And even so, with that decision, 
he's kind of come in handy for them. he's the, again he's the best player on their offense um you know even with the uh, when you look at what he's been able to do on the ground he's still ranked 15th in rushing yards and he's had a, he's had a bye week already um he's been able to produce and this like you said they're throwing the ball to him there was that one game where you said he had 19 targets he had the he had the third most all-time receptions in a Steelers game that week and he showed hey I'm willing to take the high volume passes and the, the only two guys above him were Antonio Brown in one game and then Antonio Brown in another in another game. Ben Roethlisberger is loving to throw the ball to him. Granted, Ben Roethlisberger needs to learn to throw the ball beyond the sticks a little bit, a little bit again. He's, he's relying too much in the check downs. Um, but Najee Harris is starting to provide the balance that they're looking for. I will say this, though, that Steelers offensive line is picking things up. They really like what they've added in Kendrick Green, a third round guy that they really feel like they got, they got a steal in. He's a guy that can pull and hit and way downfield in space. He has athleticism and he's starting to figure out how to be an anchor in the middle of the, the offensive line where he kind of was a little shaky at first, but now he's finding his confidence. Um, very intrigued to see how he continues to build with Kevin Dotson, another big mauler type of guy, and Dan Moore Jr. if he keeps his starting spot. Now, with Zach Banner returning, you so we've seen the last three weeks the Steelers offensive line playing better football. But do they put Zach Banner in at right tackle and then bump Chakumo Core for back over to left tackle and then sit Dan Moore Jr. down as the fourth fourth round, uh, the, the rookie fourth rounder out of Texas AM? We will have to see. But right now, I think the Steelers are in a position where, like, you know what? We had to find a guy for the next five years who would be a supreme playmaker in the backfield. They found that guy in Najee Harris. He definitely is that guy. They all, but they're like, why reach for a for the seventh, eighth, or ninth best offensive lineman when you can get the best running back? And right now they have that. And I think that they like what they're putting together on the offensive line. We'll see in the coming weeks if this group can continue to gel. Well, and that's things. And, you know, I've been trying to say this a little bit with, you know, some Bengal fans. I mean, this is one thing, you know, this will be your test. Uh, you know, for you know, yeah. this will be the defensive line where you're going to know. And this is the one where you're going to measure it. Mm -hmm. Defensive side of the ball here. Um, and now, Chris, the other day, um, look, folks, if I got to come to Pittsburgh, if people got a problem with Devin Bush, I'm coming and me and Chris going to fight you all together <laughs> on that front. Because um, but oh, and as well, old friend uh, Joe Schobert, uh, you know, in town with Pittsburgh. And but I'm also hearing that, you know, we're seeing maybe, you know, one of the guys who's not Joe or Devin, maybe playing some of the nickel or the dime. What's actually going on there? I mean, we know the names, the top names, the headline attraction of this Pittsburgh Steelers defense. But take us through like maybe the middle part of it, you know, the uh, you know the lower end part of it. As you know, as you mentioned, there's some new guys trying to find their way here, um, trying to figure out you know the, the rotation of this linebacker room. Yeah, that's the issue is that they're trying to figure out what the who's going to be the balance here. Now, Devin Bush, Joe Schobert still are that balance, but it's clear that they're still trying to find ways to get those guys breathers and have them think about less and get certain assignments out, out of their way. I think a lot of this is Joe Schobert still new to the team. Devin Bush is coming back from his. He's still like 23 years old. He's still he's still like Joe's never in, played in a three, four so. And that, that's the other thing is that you're asking a lot of these guys to adjust to being around to each other. And I think they want these guys to play fast and think less. But when they're having to switch between all the different packages the Steelers love to use, they're having to think a little bit more, and that's the hes hesitancy. Uh, that's why Robert Spillane, the guy who last year had a pick six of Lamar Jackson, had a big hit on Derrick Henry. Everyone loved to see that. But obviously not the complete linebacker that you're going to ask to do a whole lot of. So that's why they said, hey, we're going to give you one package where all we want you to do is QB spy, hug blitz, and cover if a running back is leaking out to the flat. That's all they're asking asking him asking him to do. Um, but when it comes to Joe Schobert, I mean, I, he's been a welcomed addition. He he's had four passes defensed already this season. He's shown that oftentimes they've tried to pick on him over the middle. The only time he really got beat was on one deep ball. I believe it's to Darren Waller or, or a Foster Moreau uh, against the Raiders. But other than that, he's been as expected. And that was also a game where Devin Bush went out and then they kind of had to flop rolls around and he was going to be kind of put and hung out to dry. Uh, the biggest problem with both of these guys isn't necessarily them. And I asked Mike Tomlin about this on Tuesday in his, in his press conference. I asked him about, like, hey, what's you know what's going into is this more on them is this more on, on someone else and he said well problem has been up front there's been a lot of makeshift on the defensive line you know normally the Steelers are used to Cam Hayward to to it and then behind him uh is Tyson Olulu and then they start getting to their their real backups uh you know on the interior defensive line but but Stephon to it out Tyson Olulu out and the guy they hope to step up as a depth guy Carlos Davis been out so they're down three guys in their defensive front and what was the deepest part of their defense is now 
one of the skinnier parts of their uh, of their defense. And they're calling up guys like Henry Mondo and rookie Isaiah Loudermilk and Isaiah Bugs, and they haven't been in their right spots. And what's happening, and you saw against the Seahawks when Alex Collins was getting busy, it was because those centers and those guards were leaking up to the second level and being able to wall off Devin Bush and Joe Schobert and forcing a like, hey, you got to deal with us before you even start to process the play. So that's been the issue. Now, we talked to Chris Wormley, one of the other de- depth the interior defenders for the Steelers. He talked about it like, hey, yeah, that we we talked about that all during the bye week is that that is something that cannot happen. So we'll see how serious those adjustments will be. I know that they're going to be a, a team that's going to come out with a balanced look to try and stop the run game against the Seahawks. They told us afterwards like their plan was to make it so that DK Metcalf couldn't beat them and that they would force the Seahawks run game to beat them. But Week to week, we know the Steelers like to make adjustments. I, I think that you're going to see them say, hey, no matter who's in the backfield, if, Jeff, if you're the running back with the way this team runs the ball, <laughs> they're going to try and hit you. You're going to be the focus of this uh, of their defensive game plan. So um, that's where I see this being a thing where they're trying to find ways to make sure their playmakers and linebackers can be playmakers, but they have to find ways to keep those guys clean. That's what made Jack Lambert a Hall of Famer was the steel curtain. Joe Green, um, Ernie Holmes up front, giving him time to process plays, see what's going on, and then go and make the play happen. You can look from all time. Ray Lewis needed those guys in front of him as well. The Steelers, if they want those linebackers to be playmakers, got to keep them clean. That's how. That, that's one of the best ways the Browns can get after the Steelers. If they start hitting those linebackers at the second level, you're going to see that running back start to scoot. And we'll see, because it's looking most likely that the Browns will be back to full strength for the first time in a long time on the offensive line here, as both Nick Chubb and Jack Conklin have returned to practice here today. We are going to flip it up here. We're going to go to our final segment. Chris and I are going to highlight some of our favorite, I guess I would say, matchups and maybe mismatchups that we're a little bit concerned about here, uh, Browns, Steeler-wise, as we continue to take you through your crossover Thursday. Everybody loves to wager a couple of shekels. Well, we are back in better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code LOCKED ON, all caps, no space, to receive your bonus from basketball, football, the MLB World Series, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Back here on your crossover Thursday here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's Steelers, Browns, Chris, Jeff, coming at you here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Jeff, let's get to some matchups questions here. Now, we've talked about both sides both sides of the ball for both teams, where the strengths have been, where there's been some questions, where there's been some injuries, some guys coming back. Give me the top matchup that you think favors the Browns and then maybe the top ma- matchup that should concern the Browns in this upcoming game. Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head here a little bit. Look, um, whether it's Case Keenum, whether it's going to be Baker Mayfield, and look, to this point, what we know is Baker Mayfield is planning on practicing this week. Um, what the the issue was for Thursday Night Football was the amount of swelling that he had. Now, keep in mind, this is now two weeks removed from that Arizona Cardinals game. Should it be out there? I have no idea. I'll be honest with you. Do the Browns think he should be out there? I'll be honest with you. I think they have no idea either. But it's really hard to tell your guy who you think is your franchise quarterback. If he says he can go, I don't know how you tell him, I'm sorry, we're not going to let you go. Thursday night football against the Broncos was a different thing. But Nick Chubb, Dearness Johnson, this is what makes this team hum, is the running game. And now what we saw with Dearness Johnson is that it maybe doesn't necessarily matter if it's Nick. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's Kareem. And now where you were bringing in Jack Conklin into the fold. Jedrick Wills now obviously has been – you know, his first game under his belt, first full game he had played the entire season. So the Browns were going with their mm-hmm. first offensive line. I really feel the opportunity is there for this offensive line in this running game to get it done and to lead this week. The matchup, and I know he's not done a mu- much this year, but Chris, he was an absolute pain for the Browns last year. Chase Claypool, the Browns had no answer for him, whether it was the first game, second game, third game. They had no answer for him. Week in, week out, when they played him, he scored touchdowns. He was a factor. 
They don't have a defensive back who really matches up with him. Denzel Ward right now is a little bit injured. Even still, Denzel Ward is not the physical matchup for a guy like Chase Claypool. He, For me, he just scares the death out of me. And maybe where Ben is at right now and not being able to get the ball as much down the field as he'd like is probably where Claypool is not you know, maybe missing in the passing game as much as he could be a factor. But Ben's coming off in two weeks. He's about as fresh as he's going to be maybe since week one. Maybe. We'll see. I mean, Ben's talked about being being hit up a lot and having some bruises. Let me give you some matchups here. We'll go with the with the top matchup here that I think that that favors the Browns in, in this situation. And the run game, certainly up there. But I'll I'll mention a different one just, just for you know for moving the conversation. I'll talk about the edge rushers ver- the Browns edge rushers versus the Steelers offensive tackles. Miles Garrett, Davian Clowney, you're gonna be bringing it with those guys. And the Steelers offensive tackles have been a question mark for most of the season. There's been games Chakuma Core for shut down. Von Miller the other the other week he had a really good showing and I was like where's that guy been and like you know that was kind of a, that situation when you looked at at this at the Steelers but Dan Moore Jr. has had some good weeks and then has had some really not so good weeks and then again fourth round rookie sort of thrown in there because of Zach Banner's injury and they haven't had what they what they what they thought they'd get out of that but um I'm really intrigued to see how they take on this challenge because Miles Garrett has been a thorn in the Steelers' side. Uh, you know, Villanueva had like one or two good games against him, and then that was it. He has been a problem that they've had to try and chip, double team, do whatever they can do to match up with. I expect, I, I, I expect, or I even wonder how much is Najee Harris going to be asked to stay in and help against those guys. I think they can be some of the biggest wreckers both in the run game and in the pass game for the Steelers. Ben Roethlisberger has been hit a lot this season. If uh, if he gets hit a lot in this game, it could be even more problems moving forward. But one one thing that I think could work in the Steelers' favor is a little bit of what you were getting to at Jace Claypool. It's if the Steelers can finally throw the ball down the middle of the field. That's something Ben Roethlisberger has just been reluctant to do for whatever reason. And when he's done it, it's worked. And we don't understand why he refuses to. And it's not because they're, they're not calling plays that direction. He just hasn't gone that way. In the Browns, Chase Claypool got an 18-yard touchdown pass on a post pattern over the middle. And it's just like, why don't they go back to that? Because whenever Ben throws there, he's finding success. And it's not just Chase Claypool. Because now you might see Chase Claypool line up in the slot a little bit more, try to get those interior matchups where, hey, Denzel Ward, even if you wanted to follow, that's not where he would go. You'd ask, you'd have, you'd have, try to have a, a slot guy or a linebacker or a safety to come up to try and guard him and then use Pat Fryermuth a little bit more. The, 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 the second round rookie out of Penn State has been shown that he has reliable hands. He's supplanted Eric Ebron as the starting tight end uh, and is getting targets, but he needs to get more targets. And this is how you can let Ben Roethlisberger not have to rely on too much of the deep ball, but find comfort throwing over the middle with the intermediate intermediate passes. Have Pat Frymuth and Chase Claypool going o- o- over the middle, one go underneath, one go over top, and then you force the Browns to say, hey, if you're in man, you're going to have to run with those guys because they're athletic. But if you're in zone, you're some of those guys in the middle, you have to pick. Do you come up to stop the underneath guy? Do you drop back to take the over top guy? Put them into guessing games, and then once if you hit on a couple of those, that's when the Browns linebackers are going to have to look at that and stop worrying about Najee Harris because we saw against the Seahawks, the Steelers had two jet sweep plays that worked only because the entire Seahawks defense was running with Najee Harris, and then Deontay Johnson slips around for a 25-yarder. Or in the red zone, they run with Najee Harris, and Eric Ebron catches gets a jet sweep, and he just walks into the end zone. That's what the Steelers have to do is find ways to keep the Browns' intermediate defenders, those linebackers, those safeties that will be in the middle of the field, put them on guessing games, and force them to, to have to, to not be as confident, make them hesitate just a little bit to get guys more time to work. So – both of us kind of in the same range. The Browns are really good at running the ball. They they got guys that can wreak, wreak havoc up front. The Steelers need to find a way to use some of their better athletes on offense to get the ball working over the over the middle part of the field and to challenge some of the some of the things that the Browns are questioning on defense. But Jeff, this has been a great episode as always, my friend. We always have a great time when we do these crossover episodes. Let our listeners for the Browns and Steelers know where they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. Uh, you know, as everybody knows, you know, Locked On Podcast Network, you know, each show here, you know, we are day in, day out. Um, we've, you know, I- you know, integrated to the point here now where we're doing these video things, biggest questions each week, biggest keys to victory, you know, post-game wrap-ups. 
Um, just love the opportunity. You know, the network has given us David Locke. You know, it's just you know as this just continues to grow and it's basically like, guys, just do what you want, man. Just, you know, you're all putting out content. I don't care. Just put out as much as you possibly can, and we're all loving it. Um, so you know, you know whatever you know, podcasting platform. Um, make sure you're going ahead and subscribe and checked out Locked On Browns uh, at Jeff underscore LJ underscore Lloyd. The show itself at Locked On Browns. Um, it's nice that Chris and I are going to be this cordial to each other because if he caught us about <laughs> twelve forty-five on Sunday morning, it would probably get a little hairy as we get really, really Woo! excited for this Halloween one. Um, but it's going to be a good one here. Uh, you know, the Browns absolutely need this win, as do the Steelers. Um, you know, both teams are probably going to be at a crossroads here. You know, looking up to you know Baltimore, Cincinnati. It feels weird to say Cincinnati. Um, sorry, James. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sorry, uh, Jake. But you know, enjoy the ride, guys. Um, but you know, one of these teams is going to be in an unfortunate situation come about 405, 410 come Sunday. Um, don't know who it's going to be. Knock on wood. Um, but it's going to be a good one. Should be a rowdy, rowdy crowd. Um, look, it gets crazy at First Energy anyway. Uh, add in Halloween costumes and some early cock- uh, cocktails. It's going to be it's going to be a crazy one. Halloween. It should be a really interesting one. Steelers Browns is 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 going to bring it. I mean, I think this is this has been a really good matchup, especially the last couple of years where you've seen the teams have reasons to not like each other. It's going to be fun to see how that plays out. Do follow Jeff; he does great work for with Locked On Browns Monday through Friday, just like I do great work with Locked On Steelers Monday through Friday. You can find both of us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, anywhere podcasts are hosted. If you're watching this video on YouTube, be sure to like, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We appreciate you for checking us out. Leave us five star reviews views with positive comments on apple it helps out not just our show but but also each other's shows and hey lockdown steelers fans give just some love give him some five star reviews lockdown browns fans it would be honored if you could do the same for me though i understand if you don't want to because it's steelers browns. i don't like the steelers guys but i do like chris <laughs> thank you very much if i like you too my man we're we'll be both wrapping up this sh- the, the, the week on our own shows on fridays be sure to tune in to hear our final comments going into this game but from chris and from jeff thank you for listening to this edition of the Locked On Podcast Network on Crossover Thursday between the Steelers and the Browns.